So we are going to have a conversation, some open-ended questions, some specifically to each member of our panel, talk about the regional plan, uh, talk about how it interacts with opportunity sites, and get their take as leaders of our communities uh, about where we're going in, in the future. Let me walk through some introductions. First up, Councilman Isaac Barone. Uh, Councilman Isaac Barone was elected to represent City Council Ward 1 in June of 2013. He is a native of North Las Vegas and an award-winning Clark County school teacher. He has long been a community activist, an advocate for North Las Vegas youth, mentoring students after school, and leading volunteer efforts for community improvement projects. Um, Isaac Barone is a member of the North Las Vegas Council and our downtown North Las Vegas representative. Help me welcome him to the panel. Thanks, Councilman. Commissioner Chris June Kili Kiliani uh, is our Maryland Parkway representative and Clark County Board of Commissioners member. Uh, Chris June Kiliani has lived in Clark County for more than 35 years years. During her time here, Chris has become deeply involved in the community as a member of numerous boards, committees, and organizations, as well as serving as a member of the State Assembly from 1990 to 2006. Chris was sworn in to a second term of office as County Commissioner for District E on January 3rd of 2011 to serve a four-year term and was first elected to the Commission in 2007. Please help me mention Commissioner Chris Kiliani. Mayor Michael Hancock, you just heard from recently. Um, mayor Hancock came to Denver as the 45th mayor in July of 2011, immediately began to transform Denver into a globally competitive and connected city with the fifth busiest airport in the United States, serving more than 53 million passengers per year. Mayor Hancock is leveraging Denver International Airport to make the entire Denver region a major gateway to the world. Help me welcome Mayor back up to the stage. Councilman John Mars is our Boulder, Boulder Highway representative and a member of the City of Henderson Council. John Mars was elected in April of 2013 to the Henderson City Council representing Ward 3 after serving by appointment since January of 2012. Councilman Mars represents the city on the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance Board and the Southern Nevada Health District. He's been a Henderson resident for more than 27 years and owns a marketing and consultancy firm. Welcome, Councilman Mars. <laughs> and Councilwoman Lois Turkanian from the Las Vegas Medical District representative and City of Las Vegas Councilwoman. Lois Turkanian was sworn into office as the Las Vegas City Councilwoman representing Ward 1 on February of 2005. Dr. Tarkanian has an extensive and very successful background as an educa education leader. As an educator, she held positions as a classroom teacher, a speech pathologist, principal, central office administrator at Nevada Community College and California State University instructor. Please help me welcome Lois Tarkanian. All right, so I have the fun part. I get to ask the, the questions for this section. Um, we're going to open it up with some general questions. So panel, uh, these are open to everybody. Feel free to, uh, to chime in with uh, the comments that you're most, most passionate about. The first one um, is that the regional plan prioritizes economic competitiveness and education, investing in complete communities and increasing transportation choice. Which of these themes most resonates with you, and are you most excited about seeing move forward? I'll jump in. Um, yeah. right. <laughs> Economics and education. Three of us on this panel are actually educators, and so it's part of our passion to make sure that we are communicating with our, our youth. But in reality, to me, what Southern Nevada Strong has helped us focus on, along with Brookings and a variety of other groups, is the opportunities that we have along a corridor. And as a, as a teacher, I want, it's the youth that teach us. They want bike trails that are safe to get to. They want complete streets so that they can get to school or their, their games or their parks. They, they, they are the ones who are sending the message. And we have to learn to listen to them. But we have, as electeds, 
have an opportunity to tell them that we've heard from them, we've heard from their parents, and that as we develop these types of different transit routes, we can develop retail and economics at the same time. There's ways to redevelop an area without redevelopment money, and I think that's part of the economic component in that, in that question or that position. Mm -hmm. Lois, what do you think? I agree with you, as <laughs> usual. <laughs> Um, I'd like to also say, however, that um, I, I, uh, the meeting we attended, some of us attended yesterday, brought forward to us that too often we look at the negatives people say about Las Vegas and what we don't have and what we don't do. But if we look at the positives that we have, there are many things that we can do. For example, with the medical district, uh, as, as uh, Chris said, uh, there's, we don't have to reinvent everything. We've laid the groundwork in many ways. We just have to move ourselves, quit just talking, by the way, and showing some action and move ourselves up to the next step. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to add a couple of things. I'll share this with you, Absolutely. Dr. Dickinney. Um I think what this, uh, this entire uh, concept gives us with uh, Southern Nevada Strong is an idea to think big. Think big and make big things, right? Integrate. Um, I've got, uh, without going into a lot of details, I know uh, right there, I, I, I'm happy to be the, uh, I'm very happy to be the chairman of the redevelopment agency there in North Vegas. Um, I'm getting a lot of pressure to approve a fast food uh, place downtown. Now, I don't have anything wrong in fast food, but I told uh, the, the, the owner of the place, hey, listen, um, I would like to have my students, when they graduate, find employment. If they find employment with you, it's going to be at minimum wage. However, if we take an integrated approach, and that becomes a, a medical office building, okay, my students who are at Rancho High School have a medical magnet, they're not going to go there to work in a minimum wage job. They'll be able to work there as a phlebotomist, um, as an x-ray tech, a nurse. That's going to mean a lot more, not just to uh, our, men, uh, our young men and women, it's going to mean a lot more to the entire region, not just my uh, the downtown area, the entire region. And I think uh, Southern Nevada Strong, it gives us the opportunity to integrate and think big. Um, I, I appreciated uh, the mayor's comments this morning. Um, you know, I think uh, we as a, as a region are at a crossroad, and I think Southern Nevada Strong is a catalyst of going to uh, help us propel ourselves into a future that is going, that can be. Um, it's not necessarily going to be, but it can be bright uh, for our children and grandchildren. Uh, the mayor was right. Uh, my, little, my little grandkids, uh, they know more about electronics than I will ever know, um, and they're four to eight years old, and their world looks a lot different than our world. Um, the thing that concerns me and the thing that one of the things that Southern Nevada Strong is concentrating on is how are we going to educate our children and how are we going to give them opportunities to live in the community that they grew up in. Um, that is a challenge. We see, whether we like it or not, some of our brightest kids going out of state to school, going, leaving Nevada because of opportunities, and, and I think through uh, this program we have an opportunity to really concentrate in, in, a, in areas that are going to really benefit uh, our live-work environment. And that's what our children are looking for. They're looking for a place to work. They're looking for good places to live. They're looking for transit, easy ways of getting around. And they're looking for good jobs. Um, and we can't live off of the, off of the uh, gaming industry forever. We need, to, we need to diversify that economy. And I think this is the catalyst to do it. I'll, I'll just, I won't repeat what's been said, but I'll just use anecdotally. Um, when we travel as tourists, one of the first things we think about outside of our accommodations is what? How are we going to get around, right? And when you have a negative perception about a place, it usually emanates from how you were treated in a cab or on a shuttle, what kind of gridlock you ran into, um, and how difficult it was to move around. Um, for example, I was in New York for the Super Bowl. We won't talk about that too much, but... <laughs> 
But one of the things that made me most nervous about is being there with my wife and children and, and thinking about how we're going to move around in that city. It's already challenging to move around in New York um, when there is no major event going on. But now you're talking about a level one national security event and the gridlock that you're going to run into. And we ran into it. Um, but I'll tell you, New York did a fantastic job, so this is not a knock on New York. But that's one of the things you think about as a tourist. And again, what transit does is it equalizes it. The great cities that I love to visit, that I never have to worry about renting a car, New York, D.C., I know that I can, with ease, get around that town. And so it is about access. It is about, you know, everything we talked about, jobs. It is about housing. It is about entertainment. It is about land use. And let me just say something I just also share with, uh, um, with Councilman Barlow. This issue crosses every economic strata in your community. And it engages every social economic issue that you could possibly talk about. And if you sit and think about all the tentacles that emanate from transit and transportation, I guarantee you, all the things we've talked about and plus more, you will, will come across. Thank you, panel. All right, another question. Open up to the entire panel. Here it is. The purpose of the opportunity sites within the Southern Nevada Strong Regional Plan is to demonstrate the principles being proposed through the plan. With that in mind, what is your vision for your respective opportunity site, and how do you see it better connecting jobs, transit, and housing? Well, actually, um, I have to go first. Um, I'll go on the record and saying that um, it looks to me, uh, everything that you're looking for, jobs, transit, housing, everything, uh, we can have actually a blueprint for uh, in the downtown Las Vegas area. Um, the, the, the redevelopment area, it's a, it's a nexus for four, no, well, three right now, and possibly a fourth major area of travel. Got I-15 running through the whole thing, Lake Mead Boulevard, which uh, if I get my way, it'll get straightened out and expanded and then North 5th Street, which we're, which we're constructing, and it also has a provision for light rail. I'm talking, we're, we're talking a nexus of travel right there, and it all, it all comes together right there in my, my humble little downtown of Las Vegas. The other beautiful thing is, um, I know you're gonna find the political will to get things done, and just what happens, we already, uh, the, the, the Red Development Agency already owns much of the property in this downtown area. I mean, we have a, a, a lot, uh, uh, the, um, the potential uh, for getting things done, I think is gonna be the greatest, with all due respect to all the other, uh, other sites, it's gonna be the greatest for, for, for the downtown Las Vegas area. Um, and quite frankly, um, uh, I know I, 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 I dream big, I dream big. Um, I grew up in the downtown Las Vegas area. I've, I've, I've uh, lived most of my life there. I worked there, you know, uh, North Las Vegas, uh, uh, Ratchel High School is still in the, in the downtown Las Vegas area. And I've seen the challenges and, and I understand. The, the beautiful thing is, again, that kernel that we have of opportunity, it exists here, and so, uh, there's so much uh, available land that's uh, at, at, at a reasonable price still right now with the kind of businesses that we can attract, uh, some medical, and maybe make a, uh, our own downtown North Las Vegas village, right? Again, I see it as a, a perfect catalyst, uh, I mean, as a, as a perfect breeding ground, and uh, probably your, your case study. Um, I hope uh, a few years from now we'll, we'll get invited back and we'll see that the downtown North Las Vegas area is going to actually going to be seen as the ideal test area for the for the region. I feel that the medical district that we're trying to do and that we're pushing now is one of the most exciting ventures we have had or will have within the city of Las Vegas and within the entire region. Uh, it will improve health care. The medical district working closely with proposed UNLV School of Medicine uh, will uh, provide a tremendous number of new jobs, will help tremendously economically. We already have the School of Nursing and the, and the School of Dentistry over there. We already have two hospitals there. And you know how good our School of Dentistry is? We had 3,000 applications from top scholars for 75 positions. That's what we're doing already there, and that's what I meant. Let's look at what we've got already and move from there. We haven't treated our hospital really nice, UMC. We haven't really taken the care that perhaps we could, the lack of monies. 
but it's attractive to top scholars. Uh, a medical district will have better research, tremendous addition to the reputation of UNLV if we do get that school there. <laughs> and we'll have uh, more than a dozen students going out throughout the cities, uh, throughout the city working. Uh, to present things within the school. We have 25,000 visits made by the dental uh, interns now that go out into the schools in the nearby area. And in that medical district, we have many elementary schools, we have magnet schools, we have high schools, middle schools, all of that where we could be working together. And when people say about Las Vegas that negative, which I was mentioning earlier, we've heard what we say, oh, if you're sick, uh, where do you go? To the airport. That's a joke. Okay, so <laughs> thanks for laughing, Chris. You're right. um, but in any case, that is a joke. I became ill with a very complicated disease. I, for three months, I tried to find help here within the city. I, did, I couldn't find any help. Everybody was a different diagnosis. I wasn't getting better at all. And finally, uh, I had somebody who uh, took me to UCLA, and I had the head of the immunology department there, and I was able to get help. And um, you need a research hospital, my son-in-law who's a doctor told me, you need a research hospital in order to be able to find the zebras. And I said, what do you mean find the zebras? He says, well, you're a zebra. And I said, what do you mean? He said, those complicated illnesses that have all different types of patterns on them that you have to work out. We need those things here in Las Vegas. And economically, the benefits are magnificent for what we could get there, and I'll get into that later. Uh, Maryland Parkway was chosen as one of the opportunity sites, and I'm thoroughly excited because I actually want light rail down Maryland Parkway so that we can actually connect. It's time. Uh, we need a multitude of modalities that are out there from walking, biking, light rail, whatever we can come up with. But it's about green infrastructure at that point. And it's about making sure that tourists that fly here can actually get on light rail, as, as the mayor was saying, or any other transit that's easy, safe, clean, and moves them to where they want to move. So you think about it, Russell Road in Maryland is the airport. We could go all the way down to Fifth Street and interconnect with North Las Vegas through downtown corridor in the medical district, over to the convention authority. We have the university sitting right there. If we wind up doing a stadium, we have to think about how we have that commute come into play for that part of it. And we will have a UNLV School of Medicine one way or another. And, and that, that is the economics that Lois is talking about. That's the economics that, that Isaac's talking about. We know which five or six industry LVGEA came up with. Medical is one of them, and it's not just nurses and doctors. It's about 70 other professions that can come out of that. You want to look at the interconnectivity. If the convention authority, and I hope they do, can do their business district expansion, that's a natural connection to them, whether you go down DEI or Sierra Vista in order to be able to get there. You then have not just your core downtown here, but you have a midtown in reality in that section. And so all of that interconnectivity can build the redevelopment and the economic package, mixed use. Our school district, is anybody here from school district? That's shameful. They need to get on page. Oh, okay, all right, thank you very much. It's okay, I would, tell my, I would tell my person anyway. But here's the reason why. As they debate whether or not to build new schools, do we need new schools? Absolutely, but we have to think about how to do it within the corridors that exist. Use some of them dem those empty buildings and bring the kids where they live, where they can then develop the housing, where they then can develop the retail and mixed use that comes into play. You don't all have to build 5,000 seat schools. You could use empty big boxes and convert them. And that's the way you start thinking differently about how we need to do business here. That's the key. I'm thrilled that we have four opportunity sites because there's, but we have to look at one thing. You need to break the barriers where elected politicians don't worry about, I want this in my district. I don't care whose district it's in, as long as it's better for the community. And I think that's what this panel is here for. We have to stop the false competition and look at where can you generate the best good, sustainability, TOD, all the other factors that come into play, and learn to play together in the sandbox. Because the sandbox is really pretty big, and everybody will win in the long run as far as that's concerned. 
our area in Henderson is probably a place that none of you have been to. Um, <laughs> it's called uh, Gibson Road and Boulder Highway. And it is a, for us, it is an area that is ideal because it is vacant land, um, it's a blank canvas, and we have the ability to do some exciting it things there. Um, I look at that corridor as, as that area as really a place that can change a bigger area in our city, and let me tell you why. First of all, uh, we, uh, you may have read that we, we just uh, concluded the Union Village deal in Henderson, which will bring uh, a much needed hospital, uh, a, uh, uh, hopefully a children's hospital and a cancer facility, uh, the first integrated uh, health community in the West, um, which is adjacent to this area. Uh, within five minutes of this area is Cadence. Um, the Landwell Company uh, has cleaned up a couple of hundred acres of really contaminated ground um, for the benefit of everybody in the valley. Um, by the end of this year, they will have homes on that master plan, um, and it's, it's scheduled for 11,000 homes. Um, we have got two um, medical schools um, in Henderson and a nursing school in, in Nevada State College. All of these, all of these uh, facilities are within a five minute drive of this particular area. So we have an opportunity, plus we've got Boulder Highway, which nobody realizes is for, from an RTC standpoint, is a major uh, connector from Las Vegas to Henderson to Boulder City. So um, we have a lot of things happening in that part of Henderson that can that can really facilitate growth for and work for people in Henderson, for people in the city of Las Vegas, and the people in the county, because they, they all converge there. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for people to think outside the box and say, okay, now we have a blank slate. What can we put there that is going to benefit the people in that area uh, as far as their ability to work and to play and to live. Um, I look forward to the opportunity to help plan that area because I think it's going to be an exciting area for that part of our valley. All right, thank you, panel. So next up we have some individ individual questions. Mayor Hancock, the first one is coming your way. Some may criticize light rail and say things like, ridership doesn't pay for the cost of the system and it isn't fiscally solvent. How do you counter that argument? What do you say to that? What we have seen so far in Denver is that the contrary to that statement. Um, I mentioned that the West Line um, has already been um, up and running in Denver just a few short months. And um, we've already had three million riders on that line alone uh, coming in from some of our surrounding suburbs to the west of, of Denver. Um, the reality is that you're going to find a line here and there that doesn't necessarily have the ridership to support um, today what you're trying to do. But if you think about the guiding principle that I talked about at the onset, and that is you are building this line not just for folks who are here today or for the demographics that you have today, but to, for the generations that are going to follow you and ultimately that line is going to um, uh, begin to benefit and pay for itself. The reality is also this. You know, I can name an innumerable number of things that, innumerable things that uh, we invest in in Denver that don't immediately begin to pay for themselves. These are not destination. These are long-term journeys that you are investing in. It's not going to happen overnight. We're going to have to pry some fingers from some steering wheels because you're talking about a, a culture altering, uh, altering uh, opportunity. And you simply have got to allow for it to occur. And you also have to think about, as you like to, Jonas, I'm sure you're in the business of developing, and that is, what does the multiplier look like? Is it just about the ridership? Is it also about housing? Is it also about retail and other commercial investment? Is it also about sustainability and getting cars off the road? And what are those impacts there because that ultimately is the benefit. And at the end of the day, does people, 
does the fact that people get in cars and drive pay for themselves as well? I would submit it's probably a greater economic impact in the other direction, having a lot of cars on the road and gridlock occur to productivity, to our sustainability, and to our efforts to be to live in more healthy than to have a transit system that's moving people, not automobiles. Councilwoman Tarkanian, the next question is coming your way. The regional plan prioritizes economic competitiveness and education. As an educator and clinical specialist focusing on pathology, why is the learning environment outside of the school building important to educational performance? And how do you see the Las Vegas Medical District connecting to nearby schools and vulnerable people? Beginning, uh, well, of course, learning and education is important, uh, and we need to go all the way from kindergarten through uh, the 16th grade, which is graduation from college. You begin uh, integrating within the curriculum at each one of those levels, continue it all the way up. It might be health awareness, uh, what are your specific needs in kindergarten. Then you work up to new technology, shadowing, sharing resources. Uh, we're fortunate in the medical district to have schools close to us where we can do this. They can become a model and then we can spread that information and how it's integrated within the curriculum to other schools. And uh, we've already spoken about uh, needing for these youngsters quality, stable, safe housing for all budgets. And right near the medical district, I'm bringing this up because I don't know if you're all aware of this, we have all the way up <laughs> different sections of that area that cover all levels of housing and would meet needs. We could do, use some more multi uh, uh, type of uh, uh, homes where you might have businesses, retails, and also homes at the top level of the building. And these are things we need to work on. We have older homes along uh, Charleston. We need to convert those into businesses that are more modern uh, or else into uh, retail that would be more modern. We fortunately five years ago were able to obtain a state grant, the state had it from federal funds, and we got over two million dollars for Ward 1. We began concentrating on uh, safe routes to schools and that's uh, how we got our lookout kids about that you may have seen on television. And in doing that what we did was we added 10 feet sidewalks all across going all the way from uh, Alta, where you have the Springs Preserve, all the way down past uh, Palos Verdes, and eventually we hope to have it all the way down till we meet uh, Sahara. But in any case, why did we do it that way? We did it that way because if you have a 10-foot sidewalk, you can have bicycling, you can have skating, you can have walking, you can have running, and uh, it's there for the safety of the students, it's there for multi-use by the, the families. And we also need to make sure in our communities that there are learning opportunities that complement the school experience. Near the medical district, we have the Springs Preserve, which has educational meetings, and it's sometimes a well-kept uh, secret about all the different types of nature, science, everything they have there that can be of use uh, in integrating within a co community. We can integrate more of what the medical district is doing into what they have at the Springs Preserve. You want to have things like the libraries, museums, after school programs, and each neighborhood should help with leadership skills and homework so that we complement the learning experience. If it's a medical school or whatever it is, the whole fact of the matter is to be multi-focused so that you're not going parallel. We call it silos, parallel, whatever you want to call it. The thing is to integrate what we're doing. Use our energy so we're not duplicating, but so that we're a very, very strong uh, factor. As for higher education, as our students mature, the Las Vegas Medical District, I think, is a great example. Our community should be a learning lab where you have educational programs, practitioners, residents, and economic development efforts all working together for mutual benefits and benefiting the synergy that we need to move forward. Uh, to succeed in all of this, it has to be multi tasks and it has to be a group effort. And I think from that we're going to be able to raise the economy and uh, have more jobs. And I think we're going to feel better about ourselves too. Because you know what, some of us have been fighting this for a long time. A lot of you have been out in the audience, I know. Now's the time. Can't you feel it in the air? Now's the time that we can do this and make it work.
Thank you. Uh, Commissioner June Kiliani. You've recognized the value of regional collaboration for years. In what ways do you think Southern Nevada Strong is strengthening our regional collaboration? Um, thank you. They came to the Southern Nevada Regional Planning Coalition, which was somewhat fractured and not really looking at land use, which was the original intent of it. And I have to say they brought us all together on that committee and refocused our energies into developing a regional plan that looked at not competing with each other, but sitting down and talking and figuring out what was best. They brought together, I don't know, 40 to 50 people, elected politicians from all the cities, the county, um, our county and city managers, uh, technical staff, uh, public work staff, uh, just a variety of individuals who, who really should weigh in in those. It shouldn't just be the electeds to make those decisions. And I think Southern Nevada Strong helped us set aside the boundary lines and really focus on how do we regionally get across this valley? How do we regionally come up with what's best economically? Um, we know what, there's lots of plans out there, but if you don't bring people together to talk about it, you'll never be able to implement it because you still go back as Lois and, or, or, or Isaac into your silos. So what we have to do, and I think what Southern Nevada Strong helped us do, is focus our energies on what will work so that as we then down the road talk about how do we finance this, we focus it back to the five or six points that really will work in this community in southern Nevada, whether it's Boulder City, Henderson, North Las Vegas, City of Las Vegas, the county. Focus those energies so that we come together and do what you did, which was brought your mayors together. We only have five mayors, and they were all there, but it's a much smaller group to collaborate with in a different way, but we compete falsely with each other more often than not. So I think Southern Nevada Strong has helped us set up policy. And if policy is what you focus on, then you get past the politics and the personalities. And I think that that's been part of what's been the beneficial, because you can redirect and say, we surveyed, we went into your community, we asked the businesses, we asked the constituents, not just the politicians what they wanted, and they helped us develop a regional plan based on our constituents' comments, not just what we were thinking. And I think that was absolutely key. Thank you, thank you. Councilman Mars, you represent a community that has quite a different brand from the Las Vegas brand and is really known for being a great place to live and raise a family. A key tenant of both the SEDS and the draft regional plan is economic diversification. How important is branding and messaging to talent recruitment and our ability to grow our target sectors such as healthcare, technology, and global finance? Well, <clears throat> I, I've been creating brands most of my career, and brands matter. Um, Apple doesn't make iPhones and tablets and computers, they make cool. Um, Nike doesn't make shoes and clothes, it makes performance. Uh, brands matter. Um, and uh, uh, we have a double-edged sword here in Southern Nevada. We have a gaming industry that is that has uh, uh, starting to come out of some very hard times, but has been the backbone of our community for uh, since uh, the beginning of time. And, um, and they spend a lot of money. Um, what happens here stays here is something that has been uh, all over the world. Uh, uh, and it has done a wonderful job in promoting that particular segment of our economy. But everybody who is in this room that lives in Southern Nevada realizes that we live here for a much different reason and that it is a much different community. Um, in Henderson, we hear it all the time. Um, there are very few people that realize we're the second largest city in the state um, because people in Henderson feel like they still live in a small community. They feel like they have connections with each other. They feel like that community that they live in is connected with paths and trails and parks. Um, and they're proud of living in that community. Um, what I think one of the biggest challenges that Southern Nevada Strong is going to face is the challenge of creating a regional brand um, that transcends Henderson, Las Vegas, the county, North Las Vegas, um, but creates a regional presence that says what we are as a livable, um, workable, playable community. Um, we aren't there. 
um, and uh, sitting with uh, on the uh, Global uh, Economic Alliance Board, uh, we talk about uh, some of the things that, that hinder us as a community. And it is the perception of a lot of people in the world that Las Vegas is a gaming destination and a soul, and that's all we are. Uh, we need to get past that to be able to grow uh, our economy, to, bring a, to be able to bring in new industries. They've got to realize what we are. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you, I mean, there are so many wonderful communities in Southern Nevada to live in. Um, there are wonderful neighborhoods uh, throughout uh, our region. And we've got uh, wonderful, uh, uh, you know, I know I'm going, to, I'm going to give a plug for it because uh, uh, I know in Henderson, my, my grandkids go to school at public schools in Henderson and they do incredibly well. And it's because they've got parents and, and people in the neighborhoods that are engaged in their growing and learning, and I think that's what the word that we need to get out about Southern Nevada, that we are a really wonderful, wonderful place to live. Councilman Barone, one of the key themes of the draft regional plan is increasing transportation choice. Why is it that important for downtown North Las Vegas and the Hispanic community in particular. Hmm. Does anybody here remember the, the bad old days of Las Vegas Transit? Okay. <laughs> yeah, some people do. Very, very limited service, right? That it looks like they didn't want to do anything. If it wasn't on the strip, they didn't want to do it. Um, I remember very clearly that, uh, there were times when uh, my dad or my mom had to uh, get dropped off on the bus route there where Jerry's Nuggets at, and they'd have to hoof it uh, to Donna Street and Cary, where I, where I grew up. That's quite a hike, and if you can imagine, after work, uh, my mom working uh, her, her eight hours as a maid, my dad working um, uh, as, a, as a dishwasher, that's quite, that, that's, that, was, that was quite, uh, I, I think, a burden that was probably uh, unnecessary. Um, quite frankly, uh, public transportation is an extremely important Latino community. If you, uh, if you were to take, a, a, I guess, a, a camera and put it on a, on a bus, and you see just how many of the brown faces get on and off the bus, right? We're definitely riding the bus. Uh, I, would like to, I would like to think that my community is already, it's walkable. Um, you can ride your bikes on it, but again, um, with the, uh, the, the limited um, uh, social economic status you know, of people in my neighborhood, right, and uh, in general in the downtown area, of course, you know, public transportation is extremely important. Um, that's why, uh, of, of course, you know, when we talk about uh, systems of light rail, uh, again, to, uh, to connect different parts of the city. Um, hey, um, again, my dad worked at, um, at, at the showboat when we lived, at, uh, when we lived um, near Don Street and Cary, but now uh, my constituents, they work all over the city. They might, uh, they might work in Henderson, they might work uh, in, in the southwest part of the town. <coughs> uh, of course, you know, these uh, uh, access to transportation and the related uh, uh, public transportation that, that, that goes on it is extremely important to them. Right, um, I would be remiss, uh, I would be uh, underserving my community has been underserved if I didn't push for better transportation in my area. And of course, the, the, again, you know, we have, uh, I like to think that um, we have nice connectivity to downtown, uh, North, to downtown Las Vegas. Um, we can do so much to, to, uh, to bring the two downtowns together. We can do so much, uh, I, again, to, uh, uh, to serve uh, this community and actually, open up more jobs, more employment. I mean, uh, my, uh, I have young men and women who go to my school at Rancho High School who would love to go to Nevada State College, but it's not so easy for them. You know, I mean, they would have to take several buses, you know, if they can actually ever make it. And that is definitely a limiting factor. Transportation limits your education choices, it limits your, uh, your job choices, and that's not what we want. We don't want to limit our people. We want to give them access to get ahead, and, and, and this will, in, in turn, make our entire community a lot stronger. All right, the next question, I'd like to open it up to the entire panel for whoever would like to, to chime in. This is a question that is kind of near and dear to, uh, to my heart from the, economic, the, the Global Economic Alliance point of view. 
And here it is. So our region is faced with a limited supply of industrial lands, and in particular, large industrial buildings. During uh, my remarks, I shared that we've been shortlisted by many projects during the last uh, calendar year. These large industrial big box users prevent, that would provide hundreds of, of jobs, um, yet because we don't have the existing product in place, they end up going to, to other markets. How important do you think it is to incentivize, incentivize not just businesses to come here, but developers to build the type of buildings we need to attract and compete in those industries? How do we solve that problem? I'll just share briefly. I believe it's important that folks like you, Jonas, and other economic development directors and mayors and commissioners have as many economic tools in their toolbox to attract opportunities to their uh, community. Um, we talked about this before I got and spoke, and you know, industrial land is a diminishing asset around the country. And it's interesting because it's uh, ironic the president keeps talking about um, that the United States, we all agree, needs to, we need to de manufacture more um, of what we use. And it's difficult when companies want to come in communities and set up industrial locations and, and campuses, but we don't have the land to do it. And so a lot of what Tom talked about as far as the economic tools that have to be available, whether it's tax income and financing, some of the um, tax credits that should be available. Um, we just, the federal government just issued, um, closed on a major TIFI loan in Denver um, to help with some of the transportation stuff, but also that will help us serve some industrial area. As a city, we have to have that toolbox available to us so we can attract those opportunities. We're having to, be having to build because a lot of those assets don't exist. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to put a plug in for Henderson. We got 350 acres going up for sale in about 90 days, so if you know any developers, you can. Uh, but but, but, uh, but in, we are, but seriously, um, uh, it is. Um, it is, it is imperative, I think, that for those state legislators here, um, sometimes cities and counties' hands are tied because of the, some of the things that we can do with the land that we have to, uh, available to us. Sometimes it's very difficult to make the arrangements that you would like to make with a developer to build that to build that large box, to, to take down that large piece of land, uh, because we don't have the flexibility. I would suggest that, that as, a, as a panel and as a Southern Nevada Strong, we work closely with our legislators to change some of those rules that give municipalities more flexibility to do the things that they need to do to attract that type of business. Well, that Thank flexibility you. is always, it's called taxes. And uh, you scare the heck out of a lot of politicians when they actually have to be confronted. So even though mo most of us say we want home rule, I think when you drill down to some folks, they'd rather blame the legislature for not giving them the ability to do the home rule in order to be able to assess the taxes. But let's go back to the incentivization. And that's a quandary. And uh, we, we do tax abatements in Nevada, but we have one of the lowest property taxes in the United States, we have an extremely high and regressive sales tax as well. And so where is that balancing act? I think we can't lose sight of the businesses that are here that we should be incentivizing before we just give money away to some company to come into town. And I think that that's got to be the balancing act that comes here. Right now, abatements are simply going, and they go out of the that governor's office, whatever that's called, Steve Hill's office. And it's only to lure a handful that are not bringing in people, they're not bringing in facilities, and they're getting a huge tax break that doesn't get extended to our current small businesses or our current businesses that are here. And that's got to be something that we are acknowledge and recognize. Now, incentivizing could be as simple as local governments saying, we'll speed up your permit process, we'll put you in a fast track, we will save you time, which is money as well. So there are things we could do policy-wise that could incentivize these businesses. Or the legislature could look, and John's right, you know, maybe they do a revolving loan fund for some of these companies, then you build the product, but you gotta have that product ready to come, so you're not 
taking the money, uh, what little bit we tax, away from the properties that are here and the businesses that are here. So that's the balancing act that has to come in. Overall, though, I think we're smart enough to figure out how to do it. It's, do we have the land? Yes, you have the land in Henderson, you have the land in North Las Vegas, you even have the land at Ivanpah. There are some perfect hubs that we should be taking a look at. Looking at that, that, that infrastructure, the feds can come in and assist if they really truly want to, and that was part of the message from President Obama, is let's look at our infrastructure. And then if you have a core or corridors where you can then link them through rail, through truck, through offloading, um, because the trucks take up our traffic and add to our air and everything else, so maybe you do an offload at Ivanpah Apex in some place, and you bring them down in on smaller uh, uh, movements so that they're not creating all the, 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 the bad air and, every, and congestion that comes into play. That said, we don't have much money that we generate in order to do incentives in the first place, so that's got to be part of the discussion in my opinion. And, it, and after Chris said that, I'm going to put a plug in for the city of Las Vegas because I remember what downtown looked like before and I remember the dirt and I remember the tumbleweeds and I remember people laughing about it and who would go downtown? Well, I will tell you, they laughed and we did it. We did it and downtown is good now. We, yes, that's good, yes. But you know, we did it in the way Chris says you should do it, and that is we gave tax credits, we loosened up uh, the way you had to apply for land permits, the way you had to apply for all the different things in buildings that were very, very cumbersome to construction people, and they complained about how difficult we are. Our people on staff worked extremely hard to loosen that up and still maintain high quality, which we now have. And I believe that uh, every time I go any place now, all I hear are compliments about the process. So I think we turned the corner on that. And the only thing is, and I have to say this to Ricky Barlow, you see, because he get all the, got all these tax credits, and he got all that other stuff, and uh, he is right adjacent to my ward, and I would like to see the same thing happen in the medical district, because I will tell you, it will help us gain the reputation we need, it will help us economically through diversity, through growth, through uplifting the area, through connectivity, all of that it will help us if we develop that medical district. And so uh, I'm going on record so Ricky knows that and he'll vote for it whenever it comes in front of the council, you see. And, uh, but anyway, we want to become, we want to become, see how he runs away? We want to become a global business and health destination a global business and health destination, and healthcare is right there at the top. If you read any of the magazines, any of the newspapers, you will see where they put healthcare, its importance, and how much money it brings. If we're successful with this medical district, we'll add eight to 10,000 jobs, and they won't be low-paying jobs. Most of them will be really decent or high-paying jobs, and we already have the uh, homes in the area that we can use. We've already started everything we could for the safety for children, and we're trying to work closely with the school district. So I'm just saying that if we all get together, we can make that a, a, a fact, that we're a global destination. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, I'm not gonna give a shameless plug. Actually, I will. <laughs> Anything that is happening in North Las Vegas is happening in my ward, Ward 1. And matter of fact, as a matter of fact, we're going to ride to the entire valley's rescue. We have that much land uh, that, that stretches. In my, my ward, hey, it's, it's, a, it's a great ward. It, it stretches all the way from the very south at Rancho High School, uh, Cyril's Avenue, way out to the north and around those mountains. It, it, it's, it's an incredible ward. And in that ward, of course, we have, I mean, a ton of land that's right along a, a, a railroad, right along I-15. Talk about uh, a, a place for growth. Now, um, what I really appreciate is uh, in the, in, uh, that our cities have been working together to, to help one another out. And I really appreciate all, all the help that the city of Las Vegas has, uh, is, uh, has uh, handed, extended to, uh, to our city. And um, I, I think, uh, of course, our, our friends and brothers there in, in uh, Henderson have also uh, extended help. Um, we're, we're all interconnected. 
And let's face it, if, if we were to have, say, um, an auto manufacturing facility come to North Las Vegas, right, on the Apex area, not everybody who's going to be working there is going to necessarily be in North Las Vegas. Okay, they'd be they'd, they might be wor working. I mean, they might actually be living and investing in Henderson and Boulder City, and of course in Las Vegas. The amenities that they would share, you know, uh, and uh, I would very much be in favor of uh, letting people who are prospectively coming to our valley let them know when you get when you come to North Las Vegas, you don't just get North Las Vegas, you get Las Vegas. We have a wonderful arts district that already exists in, in the downtown area. You have you know beautiful housing choices in in, in the southwest. In, in Green Valley, you don't get you don't just get North Las Vegas. You get the entire valley. Okay, and that's one thing uh, that that uh, I would like to really stress. We're we we, we are, we're an integrated valley, whether we, whether we recognize it or not, and we should play to our strengths. Um, that being said, and incentives I think uh, are important. The biggest incentive uh, I, I think uh, is uh, in, in talks with uh, my business friends. Right, they uh, as uh, as uh, as the commissioner said. They want to see us uh, to be a place where they can actually come in and we can grease the wheels, not so much with money, but with getting things done for them. You know, they, they want to have uh, laws, regulations, uh, zoning that makes sense. They, 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 don't, want to, uh, they don't want us to, to hinder them. They want us to, to support them. And that's, a, that, that's the best incentive I think that we can possibly give, you know, streamline, uh, uh, streamline policies. Um, and again, this is where, again, Southern Nevada Strong really plays into this. Again, suppose we did have a, another, uh, a, another large project coming to North Las Vegas. How are people going to get there? What we, what we don't want, you know, uh, I mean, uh, we, uh, it's, it's nice to build a road there, but again, we have to look at, at an integrated package here uh, where light rail would make sense for people to be able to, to take it to the, the place of, of business, to where they could live, of course, in, in any area in uh, the valley and still be able to, uh, to, to travel within these different uh, sectors. Um, I think that the future is really bright for us in, in this respect. And I, I think now we have an entire cadre of leaders you know, in the different cities who are looking at this and we're willing to work together. And uh, I, I really appreciate coming at this time. Uh, uh, I really appreciate coming at this time so I could work with, uh, with uh, my colleagues in other cities. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you again, panel. I, I want to be mindful of everybody's time. And if I got the signal right, Lisa, do we have time for one more question? Yep. All right, so with that in mind, uh, Mayor Hancock will send the last question your way, and here it is. Would you share with uh, your fellow elected officials uh, on the panel and in the audience, what's the hardest decision you've had to make related to transit-oriented development and planning for transit, and are there any words of encouragement you could share with our community? Well, I don't know if there'll be words of encouragement, <laughs> um, but I'll tell you, and I'll use the colloquialism, Freedom ain't free. Um, and as you make this very critical investment in infrastructure, know that it's going to lead to additional public investment that you're going to have to make to get good land use, um, to attract and to leverage the existence and the investment of the, the transit system, um, and to have good planning. And so that leads to the most challenging decision I had to make Shortly after being elected, um, my planning department and um, chief financial officer um, recognized that as we were beginning the construction process on our east line, which takes you from downtown to the airport, 28 miles, that there were some, there was some bad, um, not bad decisions, but just planning didn't take into consideration that we had some growing areas that these lines would be running near and that there were some at-grade crossings that were gonna occur. And those at-grade crossings in the long term would create some major traffic challenges and safety challenges, quite frankly, with kids trying to get back and forth to school. And so their recommendation to me was to invest $47 million of some transit or transportation money that we had to create above-grade crossing. And that would create some new opportunities, but also in the long run create, you know, protect the safety, health, safety, and well-being of the citizens who are growing up or growing around the, these, um, these, these, these new transit areas. And so it was a tough decision because we love to use that money 
that we were receiving from the state to invest in other transportation opportunities around the city. However, when you use the, follow the guiding principle that we're building for generations that will follow us, and you didn't want to have to regret the decisions of not addressing the issue today, tomorrow, saying, boy, I wish I had raised it up. It would have been much more costly and more challenging to do above grade crossing after the tracks have been laid. And so uh, I made a decision to uh, do a couple things. One, create above grade crossing, but also create, uh, enable the tracks to go both directions so we can have two trains running. And um, that ultimately has turned out to be a good decision, but one still is a hard decision to make when you rather use the money for something else, the opportunity cost. Excellent. I... <laughs> I just want to extend my thanks and on behalf of the, the audience, I'm sure, as well, panel, uh, for your wisdom, your insight in, into these uh, issues and your direction for the future of our opportunity sites. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you for, uh, for your comments and your time this morning. Help me give them another big round of applause for the entire panel.